even within the SNM. There were members of the movement that did have such views. But it was never our policy, and it certainly wasn't discussed out in the open. It was something that emerged after liberation. It was witnessing what the southern forces did to the people and their properties during the war that really contributed to its momentum. To tell you the truth, declaring independence was the best thing to do right there and then. Because if it wasn't done that way, we would have had serious problems. And not between the Isaq and the others, but within the SNM itself. I think history should be told honestly. There was some pressure on the participants. Some militia groups came to the venue from Berbera with a huge local following demanding that independence be declared. On the other hand, although I can't say for sure what their private feelings were, I didn't see anyone who was principally against the idea. After declaration, a government was established for the Republic with Abdulrahman Ahmed as president and Hassan Issey Jama as vice president. With independence declared, everything looked up. The resumption of livestock exports meant relative economic growth. Restored sovereignty and a marked contrast to what was happening in the South led to a degree of stability. However, this would not last long. The people that were returning to the country, whether they were returning refugees or fighters, did not have a community that had the capacity to absorb them. What I mean is, war-torn communities cannot absorb refugees and armed militias. Everywhere stood young fighters, armed and with nothing to occupy them. The euphoria of the liberation slowly waned. In its place, the challenges of post-war reality began to take their toll on the goodwill of all. Most liberation movements take much longer than we did to achieve their mission. Take, for example, Eritrea's liberation movement. Although we did share similarities, I can say that we were different in many ways. Nevertheless, we came into the country with a lot of loose ends and matters that should have been resolved while we were outside the country. The long brewing rivalry over power between respective SNM factions suddenly found itself with full scope to boil over. Squabbles erupted quickly and escalated easily, breaking out into full on conflict, first in Boro, then in Berbera. I don't even think that the most resourceful government could have coped with such a reality on the ground much less the first SNM government. The capacity of the government and the reality on the ground were completely disproportional. Nevertheless, the lack of unity within the SNM did worsen the situation. When once someone said to Tur, your government is too slow, his infamous answer was that he thought this was in their best interest because if they went faster, they might chip over. <laughs> Reconciliation was difficult between warring SNM factions as well as between the government and opposition. Since, however, this was an inter isaq conflict, the intervention of non isaqs became necessary, which ironically seemed to strengthen the sense of nationhood among the various sub-clans. While both conflicts were essentially rooted in the ever-widening rift between the various factions within the SNM, in Berbera, a battle over the control of public property and revenue streams gradually emerged. The government was seemingly unable to contain the mounting tension. Lootings, shootings, and petty violence had all become frequent across the country. Law and order. The biggest need was law and order and the creation of an authority a government that enforced the law because armed bandits were running havoc in the country's towns and highways. All they cared about was raiding communities and they made life difficult 
for everybody. With no resolution in sight, there was consensus that it was time for the elders to mediate between fighting factions and between the government and opposition. There had been some fighting between the respective sub-clans in the past. And here they were fighting again before the government's two-year interim period had ended. This deeply affected Tours' government, and neither his parliament nor the ministerial cabinet were able to help calm the situation. So, he called all of the elders from the various sub-clans to a meeting and asked us to take over because he was resigning. We told him that we would do whatever we could to assist him in calming and improving the situation, but that we could not accept his resignation. Fully mandated and with relative calm in place, the elders were able to travel across the country and facilitate a series of meetings that culminated in the Tafik meeting here in Sheikh. The conflict was mainly between Isaq subclans, and so the need for intervention by a party that wasn't Isaq became necessary. And I think it was the fact that they were so neutral that made the intervention of non isaqs so effective. And God bless them, they did do a great job. Meanwhile, in Sanag, communities were engaging in a series of small-scale meetings. Because of the complexity of the region's geographically influenced history, however, respective clans met in twos in order to resolve their differences and grudges individually without the pressures of a broader conference. The foundation of the peace in Senag was the fact that for two years the communities came together in a series of meetings. The unique thing about this was that they met in twos at different venues. So each sub-clan was given the chance to deal with the little problems they had with the other in these separate meetings. Women have made significant contributions to Somaliland's peace and nation-building processes. At the height of the conflict in Sanak, one of the most important responsibilities taken up by the women of this region was bringing messages of peace from one side of the conflict to the other. This was especially helpful in getting the pastoralists to peacefully share resources like grazing and water. Women who were married into a clan different from their own were particularly effective in carrying messages of peace from their in-laws to their own clan and also from their own clan to their in-laws. At that time, there were no telephones or radios, so women's role as peace messengers was very helpful in addition to their traditional responsibilities in peace-building efforts. First of all, women are most of all peace lovers because they stand to benefit least from conflict and war. Women don't have a clan. They are born into one clan but get married into another. So when it's her family clan and her in-laws fighting, it's so difficult for her because on the one hand, it's her brothers that are dying, and on the other hand, it's her husband that's dying. So naturally, women work for peace and making sure conflict doesn't easily break out. This role includes mobilizing resources and funding and preparing the venue. But nowhere was this role more visible than at the Tafik meeting in Sheikh. For the first time, women were able to exercise their right as stakeholders. It seemed to most people that things weren't moving along fast enough. So, the local women decided to organize a huge rally from downtown all the way to the front entrance of the venue. They demanded that the peace treaty be immediately signed. Accordingly, they were allowed to sit and listen in on the proceedings and witness first-hand the signing of the agreement. Timing was a crucial factor in the country's peace-building efforts. Some initiatives took place at a very early stage where a lot of social barriers still existed.
Later initiatives were built on the outcomes of previous missions that had helped to restore communication and relationships between everybody. I think it was this key factor that set apart the Sheikh meeting from the initiatives that preceded it. And it was also this factor that had allowed women to assume a greater role during the meeting in Sheikh. By its conclusion, the Tafik meeting was able to successfully bring the Boro and Berbera conflicts to an end. Nationwide stability, however, remained largely fragile. There was such a short period of time between the Burao and Berber clashes that the consensus among the elders at the conference was that further violence could not be prevented unless we established a strong system to control the clans. To undertake this, around 500 delegates from across the country gathered in and were hosted by the community of Barama. The elders thought Boruma would be the best venue for the conference as they were the most organized clan. We welcomed that idea, believing that it was our honor to host the people of Somaliland as they came together and discussed their future. Regardless of the number of delegates, we thought we were prepared enough to receive them and our community was very happy about that. Organized along clan lines, the Barama Conference was intended to address a range of topics with the stated purpose of deciding on the political destiny of Somaliland. This is where in 1993 the Boroma Conference was held. This is where Somaliland as a state was finally instituted. There was much debate over what this destiny might cover. But eventually, it was agreed that a security framework should be established before the debate shifted to national constitutional structure. Several proposals were put forward concerning the system of government. Negotiations were intense. The intellectuals and politicians met over a period of 15 days. When they returned to us, they said we've come up with three different systems. One group was in favor of a president and vice president. Another group was in favor of a president and a prime minister. While the third proposed a rotating system of presidency. We said this was unacceptable and demanded that they go back and agree on a system. After a lengthy deadlock, it was through intense negotiations and serious political bargaining that a system consisting of a strong executive president with the Council of Ministers and a parliament was agreed upon. Following this, in landmark elections, Mohammed Ibrahim Igal was elected president and Abdirahman Aou Ali Farah as vice president. A consensus was also secured on the formation of a parliament and an upper council of elders. In parallel, the Sanag peace processes were drawing to a close. After more than two years of a series of cross-subclan meetings, all major subclans of Isak and Darod came together 